Okay, so uh, next up we have a man with a very lovely shirt. Um, it's very dapperly dressed, which is convenient because he's talking about um, automated knitting machines. And his name is Tom Myers. <laughs> Hi, everybody. And uh, my shirt says hi as well. Um, 3D printers are really, really cool, um, a really, really uh, fantastic technology uh, that has the, the capability to fundamentally disrupt um, centralised manufacture. Um, I think they're really cool, but um, the problem, at least personally, I see with them is um, that they don't, they don't make things that ordinary people want. Like, they're fantastic in a hack space where you need engineering parts and custom-made little things, but there are only so many statues of Yoda that ordinary people uh, want and need in their, in their lives. Um, I, I want 3D printers to be as good as possible, and I think uh, we should design 3D printers um, to make things that are more um, useful to ordinary people, things that people will, will use a lot more in their everyday lives. Um, and so I've been, I've been doing just that. Um, I've been building a 3D printer that makes clothes. Um, I'm afraid I don't have it um, with me on stage. I was planning to, and it's, it's in my tent at the moment, but uh, I tried to put it up in the Makespace Village last night, and um, unfortunately it, it collapsed par uh, partly, so it's, and some of the bits broke. So I can't show it to you today, but I do have um, a photo, of course. Um, it's here. I don't know if you can see it, um, but uh, <coughs> there it is. Perhaps more importantly, um, I have some examples of the things it can make. Um, this is, I don't know how many of you can see, uh, I'll switch to the appropriate slide, but um, it's a tiny little EMF jumper. Um, <laughs> yeah, with a few, um, with a few mistakes um <laughs> made. Um, <coughs> this, this does, however, demonstrate um, what, what this machine is capable of. Um, and what, what I was designing it to do, which is essentially to be a, a complete 3D printer that makes um, complete clothes um, in a single step uh, from, from nothing, uh, from, from, um, you know, from wool or uh, cotton or various other things. Um, as, I, as I say, it makes, it makes clothes in a complete step. You'll see there are no seams or stitching of any kind on the, on the sides or, at the, um, or on the sleeves. Um, that's because of the way it's made. It's all, all of it's knitted together in a single, um, a single step, and um, yeah, as a consequence, it's it, it, it's it's very much a three D printer that that makes clothes. Um, I've I've talked a lot about how it can how it can um, knit. Oh, it's a knitting machine, but it, I I actually I don't I don't particularly like the term knitting machine. I prefer soft printer, so a three D printer that makes soft things, a soft printer, um, because it can it can weave as well as knit, and uh, I have evidence for this. Um, this is it's 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 very small. It's not a, it's not a big demonstration like the other one, but it's just um it's just a little piece um showing um that, that that was also made on the machine that's that's a woven fabric rather than a knitted one. Um, I should rewind slightly. That there, there are two major ways of um of making clothes um in industry, um knitting and weaving. Uh, both are um. The, Weaving is when you um, take a series of vertical threads and then uh, interlock um, horizontal ones next to them on a loom. And you just keep doing that lots of times. You end up with um, a sheet of fabric. You then cut that out and uh, stitch that together. Um, knitting is similar. Um, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail because it also relates to how the machine works. Um, I've got a video here. Uh, it's just me explaining how it works. I'll mute it because I'll be... I'll be doing the talking. I don't know how well you can see. Um, <laughs> trying to, I have to, I have to point things out, but I also have to pause it. So I'm sorry. I'm moving backwards and forth between the two. Um, this, which I will now bring to the front, hopefully without breaking it, is one of the beds of the machine. Um, you'll see how you've got a long series of these needles, um, equally spaced along it. Um, and they're, they're what hold the garment in place. So, um, oh, thanks. Yeah, if you could just hold this. Thank you. <laughs> Good man. I'm a 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you see you've got a whole series of these, um, these loops, and it's held at about a 45 degree, almost the, almost the angle he's holding it, actually. Um, and they, these, these are capable of moving up and down um, like this, and then there's a loop held on each one. So if you come out of the, just so they can see the, the thing now. Um, 
So you see um, you've got a loop of fabric held on each one of those hooks. Um, and then they're just held down by some weights you can see at the bottom. <coughs> um, and then the needle moves forwards. I don't know how well you can see this. The needle moves forwards, and then there's a little latch, um, which, I'll show you, which I'll show you on here. You see um, it's got a hook, and it's got a little latch here. The, um, you can put that down if you're... <laughs> getting tired. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a little latch here which, um, <coughs> which, which the, needle, which the um, loop of fabric goes over and past and then you feed a new, um, a new piece of fabric through the hook and um, that creates a new stitch as you're about to see in the video. Um, you can see the new stitch forming uh, in a moment just there and that creates a new loop of fabric. Um, and that you keep doing that over and over again um, to create lots of loops of fabric and consequently a whole garment. Um, and that's essentially how the machine works. In, um, in this video, I'm doing everything by hand, um, but it's just as easy to do it using um, a carriage that moves forward and back along the bed and uh, has some angled sides that push the thing up as it goes past and then push them down again. Um, and that's essentially how you, how you do this autonomously, um, like I was hoping. Uh, I'll move back to the presentation now. Uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> that's meant to be blank. I'm, it's <laughs> um, so <coughs> what, what is this technology um, capable of in um, completely well? Um, it's basically, it's, um, it's capable of making complete clothes, as I've said. It's also capable of doing pockets and various other fancy things, um, embroidery, things like that are all um, are all doable with techniques like this. What it can't do, um, perhaps obviously, is um, it can't. It doesn't have any buttons or um, or zips, things like that, because they're they're hard. You can't you can't just knit those together. There are a few ways around that. The simplest being just to get the user to sew them on for you, um, but none of them are none of them are really straightforward. And it's a little bit awkward. Um, the other important thing um, about this technology is um, making is spacing the needles as closely as possible. So in in the machine I have, um, which you which you saw, um, and for making this, the needles were quite far apart. They were about nearly a centimetre apart from each other. And that means you have to make um, sort of chunky garments like this. Um, obviously, that's not ideal. We'd much rather make thin things, because that's what most clothes are made of. Um, and so the way you do that is instead of having them like a centimetre apart, you have to have them something like a millimetre apart. Now, that is, that's definitely feasible. Um, I have examples of, of needles here, which are, I think, 340 microns wide, about a third of a millimeter. Very, very, um, very, very thin needles that that can accommodate um, being spaced very closely and consequently making really high quality fabrics. The hard part is actually um, aligning them together in a bed like the one you saw. Um, you can't really do it on a laser cutter like I made that bed with, because the resolution, the the width of a beam is about 150 microns, um, which is which. Uh, means you're basically running out the resolution limit of the machine of, of the of the laser cutter. Um, <coughs> so what you there's the the way you do it instead is you have you have a big block of aluminium and a very thin circular saw and you just cut the grooves one by one, which means you have to do it by hand and it's tiring. But it's it's possible is the point, and that as a consequence of that, it um, in the future we'll be able to make um, really high quality fabrics, um, <coughs> you know, completely autonomously. Uh, that's very cool. But um, why would why would uh, why would um the next question I want to answer is uh, why would um a user want any of this? Um, so we we already have a fashion industry um, that's that's very functional and we we all use it. Um, why why would we need to change it by um designing these machines that can custom make that can three D print that can custom make clothes? Well, there are a few advantages. The first is um is the fact that it's custom made means it could be fitted much more easily. Um, so when you're making these in China or the Far East through a long supply chain, it's really hard to do anything better than sort of small, medium, large. But if you're making it in your own home or very close to your own home, um, it's pretty easy to um, to simply uh, take somebody's um, size, their waist, their waist size, um, height, and so on, input that into the machine, take the design, map that to your particular spec, and, and custom make it for you right in your own home. Um, that's that's very feasible with this technology, and it means the clothes it makes will fit better than any that you'll find on, that have been mass-produced. Um, a second advantage is speed. Um, uh, fashion obviously moves and changes quite quickly, and it's really beneficial to be able to um, 
move quickly along with it. Um, and the, the, the various fashion houses have, have lead times for their manufacture that vary between sort of a nine weeks to sort of six months. And that's a huge amount of time to wait to bring in a new design. Whereas with this, um, all you would need is a fashion designer to design something, upload it. You could pay them a small amount, download it, and make it really, really easily um, and m much more quickly, allowing you to stay on top of fashion trends. It's also really good for fashion designers because um, at the moment, if you want to make any kind of fashion line at all, you have to. Um, there's, there's an initial outlay to. Um, <coughs> there's an initial outlay to, to making any of this stuff. You have to. Uh, you have to be fairly confident that you're going to sell it in order to make a profit. Whereas with this. Um, you just upload the design online. If one person makes it, you've already made a profit. There's no wastage, there's no loss. And it allows people to be a lot more experimental and a lot more creative with, it, with their designs because they can take risks if things don't succeed. Um, the, the final advantage is ethics. Um, so obviously a lot of the clothes you'll find on the high street, a lot of the clothes that we wear, um, weren't made in very ethical conditions, you know, low wages, cramped, long hours and so on. Um, and this absolutely guarantees that that isn't going to happen because it's made right there in front of you. Um, so uh, that's et so ethically, it's a real advancement, and I think it could also pressure the fashion industry into uh, into improving their own standards if there's a viable competitor that um, that doesn't have any of these ethical issues that they have. Um, yeah. So um, finally, I'm just going to talk about what other technologies exist. Um, clearly, this is this doesn't exist in a vacuum. I didn't just invent all of this from scratch. Um, uh, it's uh, a lot of a lot of this technology um, existed in the 70s and 80s in the form of these these old knitting machines um, that got ever that got more and more sophisticated um, up until up until the mid 80s I think um, when when it when it when it, um, they made less and less of them and they eventually um, stopped and the industry essentially it eventually stopped which was a real shame because they were getting very close to building what I want to build now which is a completely autonomous machine I have. Um, this, which was made on a machine in uh, in our local hack space, which is called MakeSpace. Thank you. Um, I have this, um, and the machine this was made on has most of the comp has most of the important components um, that I would want from this. So um, there's a duck by the back, which is distracting me. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> got another audience member. Um, sorry, all you live streaming people, you won't see that. <laughs> um, so. Um, as I say, yeah, um, the technology exist has existed for a long time to be able to autonomously knit things. The problem with the, the machine this was made on was all the bits just weren't connected together. It had the motor, it had the electronic um, needle selection, it had the uh, computer and so on, but there wasn't an internet infrastructure to download and move designs. Um, and so it just wasn't a technology that was ready for its time. Now, of course, computers have got so much, so much faster and more sophisticated and everybody's got internet-connected devices coming out of their ears. Um, it's far, far easier to... Um, design things like, um, it's far, far easier to, to make and share designs, and so an autonomous um, machine like this would be, um, would be far more powerful. Um, it's also based heavily on the OpenNIT project, which many of you may have already heard of. Um, that's, that's a project to, to build something very much like this, an, an open source knitting machine, essentially. Um, the only, um, the problem with that I have, I mean, a lot of this, this design of the machine I have here is based on the OpenNIT, is based on OpenNIT's work, but I want to really go beyond OpenNIT. Um, in terms of, they, they only seem to want to make um, an old, a knitting machine that's capable of making woolly jumpers. I want to be able to make a knitting machine that can do everything. And with um, the weaving technology I've shown, with the much um, higher resolution, closely spaced needles, it's mu it's, I, um, I believe it's, it's um, possible to do that. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of um, my, my talk, but I've left, um, I've left some time for, for questions um, in case you, you didn't understand any of what I said, which is quite likely given how rambly I am. Um, I believe we have a mic coming around for people. Um, perhaps you? Yeah. So, can you explain how your stitch making is different from a traditional knitting machine? Um, the stitch making isn't different. Um, not in terms of when I want to do a knit. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the same process. Knitting's always been the same. Um, and yeah, the, the only difference is if I want to do a weave, I have to right. use a different technique, um, which involves a lot of loop transfers and things. Okay, um, but, but the, the, the knitting needle. is essentially the same process, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so how do you um, model the clothes? Like I'm thinking traditionally 3D printers, you use something like OpenSCAD yeah. or something. How do, how do you do that for 
for this? Um, well, there are a few ways. Um, it's actually not at the point yet where I've had where I've been able to create a fully modelled cloth. And uh, it's still an early project. I haven't got to the stage where I need to where I can get a fully modelled item of clothing and put it in. But um, in terms of this, for instance, um, th you would probably um, have some kind of XML file coding this this as one loop, and then this is two more. Um, and code that in. You could you could go as far as say as specifying where each stitch is supposed to be, and telling it to stitch there, then stitch there, then stitch there. There's a, there's a quite a few levels of abstraction you could go. You could be that sort of um, complete machine code to very abstract, um, just just the general outline still with still still to be mapped onto a person's body. Uh, yeah. Um. That looks like it's really two flat things joined at the edges. Yeah. Can you do sort of three-dimensional shaping in a general way, or is it really a, a flat thing kind of a structure? It's kind of two flat things connected. Um, the machine looks like this, and so you see it's two flat beds yeah. opposing each other. So there's always an element of um, two flat things. But I think you can be you can be a, a bit tricksy with it if you. Um, there, there are all sorts of tricks you can do to try and mitigate that by maybe making the seam sort of diagonal rather than straight along the thing. Um, yeah. Uh, but there's no fundamental way. But that's the same problem you have with normal clothes anyway, that they're two flat things sewn together. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a massive improvement, but it's still a bit of an improvement because you haven't, don't have a, a, sti a, a seam anymore. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Are you familiar with knit ML? No, I'm not. It's a knitting language okay. based on XML. Okay. And the goal of this would be yeah. that it's a universal language. Yeah. So that I can write a pattern in knit ML and someone, say, in Brazil could. Yeah. And they wouldn't need to. I don't need to speak Portuguese. Yeah. And they don't need to speak English. And we yeah. could exchange patterns, knitting patterns, yeah. through this medium. And I'm thinking that might be yeah, that a would way be, to. Yeah. That would be a good way of answering her question, actually. Yes, that exactly. That is how you, yeah, yeah. how you create yeah. a garment on that is that you yeah. need a programming language yeah, that yeah. speaks knitting, yeah. basically. As I say, I'm still, the, the machine's still a prototype. I haven't okay. got to that stage yet. But Are I, you on I, Ravelry? When I do, sorry? Are you on Ravelry? No, I'm not. Okay, we'll talk after. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you said it should be on Ravelry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So... Um, I do hand knitting. Um, have you thought about sleeve attachments? Uh, I'm, afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid I don't do hand knitting. So uh, it, it might be difficult to answer like, questions. So like. look at the clothes I'm wearing. This is yeah. obviously is a knit fabric, but yeah. you do not want the stretch of a sleeve to be the same direction as the stretch of your body part. It needs to no. be down the sleeve. So yeah. uh, any thoughts yet? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> But uh, it's a very versatile machine. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of clever tricks you can do with it. It, it is different to hand knitting in quite a few ways. Um, but in in general, you can um, you can usually get around um, yeah get around quite a lot of stuff by doing things in in unusual ways. We should talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, maybe you could give. Uh, uh, more fully fleshed out example of one of the unusual ways. I can't imagine how you would make like a shirt with a pocket because it has sort of two cavities. Okay, well one way of or, doing uh, that. Maybe there's another example yeah. that would just something uh, no, surprising. A shirt, a shirt with a pocket is a good example actually. One way of doing that would be um, instead of knitting on all of the needles, you only knit on half for each bed. So you knit alternate needles, one knitting, one knot each way. Now that increases the spacing between needles obviously, so you have to use a really low, uh, really low spacing to start with. But once you've done that, you've got half the needles spare on each one. So um, once you get to the pocket, you then start, um, you then knit forward back for your loop of the thing, and then you go back to the needles where you want the pocket, and you do another stitch just along the remaining needles that haven't been, that you didn't use to, to make the um, thing by only using half. You do that for a few rows, make sure it's joined up at the ends by um, perhaps combining alternate, perhaps do, doing one row like this, and then the next like that, and then doing round on each one. Um, that would mean that the pocket was connected to the whole thing and then um, keep doing that until you stop doing the pocket and then just go back to knitting the, the shirt from there on. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a very clear explanation. It's mostly just me waving my hands, but it is possible, a pocket, certainly. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, cool. 